me begin, uh, begin again by saying I appreciate so very much the opportunity to be with you here this week in this gospel meeting. I certainly uh, regret that Brother Caldwell could not come due to his uh, health, but uh, certainly good to have the opportunity to be here uh, with you, to be able to spend the week with Katie, and to be able to visit with Mike and Andrea when she's taking a nap. Uh, during the day, it'll be certainly good to be with them. Appreciate the work that he's doing here, and so it's certainly good to have the opportunity. And I appreciate every opportunity that is given to me to preach the gospel. It's what I enjoy doing, and so I certainly appreciate your invitation this uh, this week. Tonight, we're going to talk about the question: Do you appreciate your forgiveness? And so that'll be the topic for this evening. I'll have more to say about what we'll be talking about throughout the course of the week. The one lesson that I do know on Friday evening, I'll close almost every gospel meeting with a first principle uh, lesson, and so we'll either on Friday night be talking about why have you not obeyed or where will you spend your eternity. If you have a friend that's not a Christian, that'd be a, hopefully every night will be a good night to invite them to come, but that will be especially a first principle lesson where we'll look at the need to obey the gospel and what the Bible says about, about that topic. You know, the book of Philippians is an epistle that was written by the Apostle Paul while he was in prison at Rome. And I think the overall theme of the book of Philippians is about commitment to Christ. He is our life. He is our hope. He is our, our, he is our example. He is our hope. He is our strength and our sufficiency. Uh, some identify the idea of joy as being the message of the book of Philippians. And while I would not identify that as the theme of the book, there's absolutely no doubt that it is a, uh, an overall part of its message. The word joy, rejoice or joy occurs 17 times in the four chapters of the book of Philippians. And in the passage that was just read for us in Philippians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul was writing to say, I don't know how things are going to turn out. Yeah, I'm in prison, and he later on he's going to say, I might be poured out as a drink offering. It's very different language than what he wrote in 2 Timothy, where he said, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. Paul is saying, I might be, or perhaps I will be. I may not get out of prison alive. I might well be executed right here. And if I had a choice in the matter, I don't know which I would choose. On one hand... It's needful for me, for you, for me to be here and to teach you. On the other hand, from a personal standpoint, to depart and to be with Christ is not just better, but it's very much far better. And it's always amazed me that the Apostle Paul in that environment of being in prison and uncertain about his future could talk so much about joy. And not only to talk about joy, but to tell the brethren there that he was convinced that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress, and the English Standard Version says, for your joy in the faith. That is, not only did Paul have joy, but writing to these brethren at Philippi, he said, you too can have joy in the faith. Some translations, like the New King James that I preach from, Drop the word or the article, the, and just talk about the joy of faith. It is probably that the joy of the faith is better. But I want to tell you, at the end of the day, it really doesn't make much difference. Lewis Willis said in commenting upon this particular uh, discrepancy in some of the translations that these two ideas of personal faith and the faith are not mutually exclusive. They go together. When saying that the Christian life is a life of faith, we simply mean that we must have personal faith in the doctrine of faith. And so even though there's a difference, at the end of the day, there's not much of a distinction because we have faith that's based upon the faith, upon the Word of God. But I want to talk with you for a few moments about this idea of the joy of the faith. What is the joy of the faith? And then how can I have that kind of joy? But let's begin by talking about what is the joy of the faith. And I guess to appreciate that, you've got to appreciate what is the faith. 
When the Bible talks about the faith in the Scriptures, what is the Bible talking about? It is what the apostle preached. We think about the faith. It is that message we talked about even in the first hour. In Galatians chapter 1 and in verse 23, you may remember as the apostle Paul defends his apostleship and points out that he didn't get his message from Jerusalem, but he received it from the Lord. He quoting about his past life in Jerusalem, he said they were only hearing that he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith that he once tried to destroy. So when we think about what is the joy of the faith, what's the faith? The faith is what the apostles preached. It's what the first century Christians obeyed. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, as the church was beginning to get underway and they dealt with that first church problem, of the Hellenist widows being neglected in their daily distribution, it said in Acts 6 and in verse 7, the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So when we talk about the faith, it is what the first century Christians preached. It's what the apostle Paul preached. It's what the first century Christians obeyed. It is the message that was delivered to the saints, Jude 3. Remember in Jude 3 when he was writing to them to earnestly contend for what? For the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. So when we talk about the faith, we're talking about the gospel message. We're talking about what is to be obeyed. We're talking about what was delivered to Christians. There's a first point here that apparently is running off of the the slide. But in Philippians chapter 1 and in verse 27, it just simply identifies for us that the faith is the gospel. Look at what he says here. Philippians chapter 1 and in verse 27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And so the Apostle Paul uses the word gospel and the word faith interchangeably. We talk about the faith, we're talking about the Word of God. Why is the gospel called the faith? You know, sometimes you can have more than one word that describes the same body, but it emphasizes a different aspect of it. I mean, for example, we might talk about the church. The church is the same as the household of God, is the same as the flock of God. Those terms can be used interchangeably, But each one of those terms describes a different aspect of our relationship. We might talk about elders. One might be an elder. We might refer to one as being a bishop or an overseer, or one might be a pastor. Those terms are interchangeable. They refer to the same group, but each word describes a different aspect of their age, of their responsibility uh, to, uh, to supervise and to oversee or the job of being a shepherd to the flock. Same, same body, same individuals, but each word describes a different aspect of it. The same thing is true when we talk about the Word of God. It's the Word of God that describes its origin. It is the gospel. It is good news. It is doctrine because it is taught. And it is the faith because it is that which is the basis of our faith. In Romans 10 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul said that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Why would we refer to the gospel as the faith? It is the faith because it's what we are to believe and it's how we develop faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. In fact, the spirit of faith, Paul said we have the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believe and therefore spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. What is the spirit of faith? A spirit of faith is the spirit that says what is written is what we're going to do. We're going to follow the word of God. 
I say all that to say that when we talk about the faith, the joy of the faith, we're talking about a joy that comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That when a Christian accepts that message, they fully believe it and they follow it. Do you know what the result of that is? It's not that we ought to walk around with our heads down like we're sucking on a sour lemon all the time and we're unhappy. The result of following the faith is we ought to rejoice. There's joy and peace in what? In believing, Romans 15 and in verse 13. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 8, Paul said, believe, or Peter said, you be, uh, believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible. By the way, the joy of a Christian, this lesson is part of a, bra, uh, a whole series of lessons on joy, so we're just looking at one. But if we were to think about the context of 1 Peter chapter 1, the joy of a Christian is unique. And it is unique in that it is not affected by external circumstances. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 1, if I were to go all the way back to verse 6 and start reading, he says that they were being grieved by various trials. The trying of their faith being more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then he said, in this you rejoice. Why? Because... In spite of the circumstances, there was something to bring them happiness and joy. It was their faith in the Lord and in His message. So what is the joy of faith? It is a joy that comes from following and obeying and accepting the gospel message. Now let me ask you, how does the faith and the faith bring joy? Really what I want to do is I want to just walk us quickly through the book of Philippians and see some of the things that the Apostle Paul said about himself that I think shows us how we have joy, even sometimes when the world around us isn't what we want it to be. Even though sometimes even in our personal lives, things might always be what they want to be in terms of our, in terms of our health, in terms of uh, other areas of life, yet we can rejoice with joy inexpressible. How is that? Well, let me say first of all, when one has faith in the faith, it gives us a purpose in life. You ever dealt with somebody who didn't have any purpose in life? They didn't understand why they were here, or, or, or maybe men grow older, sometimes you deal with men in the midlife crisis, and the, the, the point is they just think that their purpose has been served. There's nothing left for them to do. But I want to tell you, when we have faith in the faith, we always have purpose in life. In Philippians chapter 1 and in verse 16, look at what the Apostle Paul said. He said, The former preached Christ not from selfish ambition, uh, or, or, from selfish ambition, not sincerely, uh, supposing to add affliction to my change, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Paul said, I have a purpose. Here I am in prison, but I tell you what my purpose is, I'm going to defend the truth. Verse 21 Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And if I live on, I'm going to live my life in service to God and to glorify His name. You know, if I truly am living by the faith, I always have a purpose in life. I'm, I'm getting to a point in life where my children are just about, all my children are legally adults now. One finishes, uh, the last one finishes high school here in, in about a month, my job of raising my children is just about, about done. I tell you what, that doesn't mean I'm, I'm done. That doesn't mean I don't have purpose in life. Uh, things transition and things change. But until my hands are folded in death, I tell you, the purpose I have is to bring honor and glory to the Lord and try to spread His message. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. I have a lesson. Sometimes I, I preach in gospel meetings based on Philippians chapter 1. But I make the point that if you were to fill in that blank, for me to live is, and you just fill in the blank, what would, what would be the all-consuming part of your life? I'll tell you what a better question might be. How would somebody else fill in that blank? See, I know people, people that are Christians, that if you put in that, but for me to live is, it would be for me to live as sports. That's what consumes their every thought, their every moment. It, it, it trumps their relationship. For me to live is work. It's about money. For me to live, you just fill in the blank because i tell you how, why that's important. For me to live is determines whether death is going to be gain or not. 
I tell you what, if for me to live is money, then death is the end of all earthly possessions. But if for me to truly live is Christ, then to die is gain. Why does the faith bring joy? Faith brings joy because when I'm living by faith, I have a purpose in life. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I tell you, faith allows me to look for the good even in adversity. I don't always understand why things happen the way they do. In fact, I think the book of Ecclesiastes points out, if we try to figure everything out, why does this happen and why did God allow that to happen, we're just going to frustrate ourselves to absolutely no end. In fact, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 uh, through chapter 5, that second discourse in the book of Ecclesiastes, I believe the whole point of that is God has a purpose that has a plan, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to sow, a time to reap. Man must fit into that plan. I know there is a plan, and I know God is in charge, and I will never fully understand it all. And that's where faith comes in. That I trust the Lord is always operating in the best way and in my best interest. And that allows me, even in moments of adversity, to see when good can come from that. The, the, the Ecclesiastes writer said, In the day of prosperity rejoice, and in the day of adversity consider, for God appointed one as well as the other. But I wanted you to notice what it calls the Apostle Paul to do. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1, 12 to 18, found himself in a Roman prison. Not only did he find himself in a row in prison, it's hard to imagine that brethren decided to use that as an opportunity to gall the Apostle Paul. And they were trying to torment him. They preached the gospel out of selfish ambition, thinking that this is going to add affliction to Paul's chains. They didn't know Paul very well. Because the Apostle Paul said, you know what? They may be preaching the gospel for the wrong reason, but you know what? I can see some good in that. They're preaching the gospel, and at least I'm glad the gospel's being preached. I tell you, when one lives by faith that's based on the faith, it brings them joy because even in moments of adversity, they can look for the good that can come from that. You ever look back at your life, by the way? And see some circumstances and situations that you've gone through that were adverse, and yet I can see the good that came from it whether it was refocusing me spiritually, causing me to count my blessings, or whatever the case might be. I didn't have the faith brings joy. The Apostle Paul said, faith gives me a purpose in life. For me to live is Christ. It allows me to look for the good even in moments of adversity, and faith is not focused on self at all. When one is truly living by faith, then they look not only on their own interest, but also on the interest of others. I almost guarantee that if you look back in life at the times you were the most miserable, the most unhappy, when you had been robbed of your joy, those are probably moments when you were focused on self. When we were focusing on what, about what I don't have or what I'm going through. And when we're focused on self then inevitably it leaves us sometimes unhappy and miserable. Paul said that's not how the Christian life is lived. He looks not just to his own interest, but for the interest of others. In fact, it doesn't put others on par with ourselves, but it counts others as more significant than ourselves. Do you know who he appealed to as the supreme example of that mindset? It was Jesus, who gave up everything in order to, that you and I could be saved. In fact, he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, did not count equality with God, some translations say a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself and, gave, and took on the form of a servant and, and came in the likeness of man and ultimately died the most agonizing death on the cross. You know why he did that? Because he was focused on you. Do you know even as Jesus hung on the cross, Hebrews chapter 12 talks about for the joy that was set before him. In that moment, what allowed him to rejoice was he wasn't focused on self at all. He was focused on the joy that he could bring to you and I. And I want to tell you, faith can bring joy because when I'm thinking about others and how I can serve, I'm not focused on self at all, and that brings joy. I tell you what, faith doesn't focus on the sacrifice, but on the gain we have in Christ. More and more over the last few years, I've seen a lot of Christians that have made themselves miserable because of the world they say we live in. Uh, 
in the, their, their, their every moment is, is comprised of thinking about politics and what's going on in the political realm. I and there are reasons for concern in those areas. Don't get, don't get me wrong. But their every moment is consumed with thinking about those things, and as a result of that, they made themselves miserable. And there are really a couple of things I think about when I, when I think about that kind of misery. Number one, why are we surprised that the world is living contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ? In fact, did the Lord not tell us, even in His personal ministry, if the world hated me, it's going to hate you? Did, did, did Peter not write in 1 Peter chapter 4 to those Christians and say, why are you surprised as if though some strange thing is happening to you? Why is it that we act surprised that the world is going in a direction away from God? The world lies under the sway of the wicked one. It always has and it always will. So why are we surprised, number one? But tell you, the second thing is, what if I have to give up everything in order to serve the Lord? What if there is persecution that affects us here in our city? What if they put a consequence on me preaching the gospel? What if in the worst case scenario I had to give my life for the cause of the Lord? You know what the Apostle Paul would say? What a wonderful opportunity. What if, in fact, in Philippians chapter 3, 1 through 14, I want you to notice here in those particular passages that the Apostle Paul said, I gave up everything that was gained to me. Here the Apostle Paul, if you look back at his life, he was advancing in the Sanhedrin, something he had a seat on the Sanhedrin already. If he didn't, they think it was shortly about to come. He, was one, he, he had been educated at the feet of one of the most respected rabbis among the Jews, Gamaliel. A well-educated Jew, a, a persecutor of the church, he was advancing in Judaism beyond many of his own contemporaries. His whole life was laid out right before him. And Paul said, I gave it all up in order to gain Christ. In fact, do you know what all that is, Paul said? Depending on your translation, said, I count them as dung, the old, trans, uh, the old King, New King James Version says. I count them as rubbish. It is all trash, Paul said, in comparison to what I gain in Christ Jesus. In fact, my understanding is literally, out of the Greek, that word rubbish can refer, it can refer to dung, but it can also refer to that which is thrown to the dogs. Uh, we don't feed our dog now trash, uh, scraps off the, the table. I can remember growing up when we had leftovers. First of all, if we had leftovers and there was enough, they went in the refrigerator and we ate them the next day. But if there was a little bit left that was just not fit or on the plate that wasn't fit for human consent, it was thrown to the dogs. But what the dogs got was what was worthless, what was not usable. After that, Paul said, everything I gave up was rubbish compared to Christ. You know why Paul could rejoice? Because Paul didn't sit in his prison cell and say, do you know what all I had to give up? Do you know where I could be right now? Instead, what Paul focused on was his gain in Christ, and he said, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. So I pressed toward the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Why is it that faith brings me joy? Because I'm going to tell you, when I'm living by faith, I've got a purpose in life. And I'm focusing on the good that can come even from times of adversity. I'm not focused on self at all. And I'm not focused on what I had to give up. But I'm focused on what I gain in Christ Jesus. See, one of the favorite songs that we don't sing it a lot at Northside. But you ever sing the song here, I travel down the lonely road and no one seemed to care. We just thought, well, look at what we had to endure. But then it closes with talking about what Christ gave up for us. Tell you, when I focus on that, I don't sit and lament my circumstance in life, but rather I rejoice in the gain that I have. I tell you why faith, why true faith doesn't uh, rejoices is because faith doesn't worry. Philippians chapter 4 and in verse 6, the apostle Paul, Paul said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. See, worry is one of the things that um, I don't know that I've completely mastered that lesson yet. It's, it's always a growth process. 
But I tell you, when I worry about things, you know what that's an indication of at that moment? is a lack of faith. When, when the disciples were at Jesus, often would say, Oh, ye of little faith. In Matthew chapter 6 is the Lord's long discourse on, on worry. And he points out again, Oh, ye of little faith. Did, do you not know that the Lord will take care of the... He takes care of the lilies of the field. He takes care of the sparrows. Do you not think He's going to take care of you also? So here in Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, Don't worry about anything. Well, why, why is it I'm not anxious about anything? Because I take it to the Lord and I cast my cares upon Him. Do you know what the result of that is? The peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And I think the idea, it is an unexplainable peace. You try to explain it to somebody in the world. You try to explain to somebody in the world how somebody can face death and they face it with peace and confidence. You, you, uh, you try to explain why in the midst of, uh, I have a lesson, I don't think I'm going to preach it this week, but last year somebody, a congregation asked me to come and to preach a series of lessons on living in difficult times. And they asked me to preach on how does a Christian live in hard economic times with inflation. And my first thought was, well, that's not my job to talk about that kind of thing. But then as I, pre I put the lesson together... I realize that, that there are some principles that help us along the line. But I tell you, one of the principles is somebody said, well, how do you respond when, when inflation goes up and the house prices are going up and a gallon of milk is three times what it used to be? How, how do you respond to that? And my answer is, I don't worry about it. Because the Lord has said, if we seek Him first, He will take care of us and He will provide for us. And I'll just throw that on the Lord's plate and I'll let Him worry about all of that. And I need to worry about serving the Lord. I tell you, when I worry about things that rise me of joy, but when I have faith, then I take it to the Lord. And faith doesn't worry about things. It thinks about good things. Look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. I know a lot, I, I said this a moment ago, I know a lot of early, uh, older Christians, by the way, and if you fit in this category, then I do think you need to think about changing this, that do nothing but sit in front of Fox News or some other news 24-7. They just fill their minds with all of that. You know what the result of that is? They find themselves miserable because, all, and I would be too, because all they think about is what's wrong. You know what Paul said in Philippians 4 and verse 8? Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. If we meditate on things that are good and holy and right, then we can have joy. Yes, the world may be in upheaval. I tell you, sometimes I look around at church at Northside and then somebody's just obeyed the gospel. What a cause for rejoicing. There's something good. I come together with, 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 with brethren of a like precious faith three times a week. I've got brethren. I know I, that would be for, there for me in a moment if I needed anything. I've been treated far better than I deserve all through the... And I tell you, when I think about good things as opposed to everything that's wrong, you know what the re result is? I rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say, rejoice. I've learned the secret to contentment faith has. Philippians chapter 4, 10 to 13. The Apostle Paul made this point. Uh, the brethren at Philippi had, had sent once and again to his, his need. They had helped him out numerous times, but from the beginning of the gospel. And Paul does express his, his appreciation for that sacrifice, or that contribution they had made. But he made this point in verse 11 of chapter 4, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. You know what Paul said? I've learned the secret to contentment. I want to tell you, contentment doesn't mean there's never anything I want. Uh, contentment doesn't mean, I, sometimes I've been asked this in Bible questions, contentment mean I can't want a new car. I can't purchase it. C contentment doesn't mean that there are never any things that we might want, but what it means is we don't allow that to rob us of appreciating what we do have at that moment uh, in time. And sometimes 
we, we fail to appreciate how blessed we really, we really are. In fact, I think contentment grows out, I think, partly in recognizing God has given me what I need. One of my favorite prayers in the book of Proverbs, the prayer of Agur, Proverbs chapter 30. And he prayed to God, give me neither poverty nor riches. No, I, I don't want to be so poor that I'm in need and that I'm tempted to steal and provide in some, some ungodly way. But I tell you what, on the other hand, don't make me so wealthy that I forget that I need you. Give me just what I need. I don't know about you, but by many in the world standards, I'd be considered to be rich. And I do realize that God has blessed me beyond what I really need. And I tell you, I need to learn to be content. And when I'm content with what well, I've got a roof over my head, I've got a car that gets me everywhere I need to, to go, there's not a time in my life I have ever sat down at a table and wondered about whether I was going to be able to eat or not. Now, I may not have the finest cuisine in this world, but I always have food on my table. And I tell you, faith in God allows me to be content because I know God has given me all that I need. And I appreciate those blessings. And we need to be thankful. Why does faith bring joy? Because faith brings contentment. And finally, this morning, faith recognize, or finally on this point, faith allows me to recognize that with Christ I can get through anything. Philippians 4 and verse 13. It's many people's favorite Bible verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I think the Apostle Paul is pointing out that one cause for joy is he realized that with his reliance on the Lord, there is no circumstance in life, no temptation, no persecution so difficult that he could not endure it and get through it. And so sometimes when we worry about things and battling temptation, I need to remember, you know, God has not put a temptation in front of me that he has not also provided a way of escape. And I think through Christ, I can get through that. What if, what if this world continues down the path it's going? What if our country gets more and more wicked? What if, the worst case scenario, they pass a law that they say, Mike, you can't preach on that sin anymore. You're not going to be able to, uh, we're going to silence the gospel. You know what I know? I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. If I rely on, I get through it. And heaven will be worth it. And I tell you what, that allows me, even in moments when things are not what I wish they were politically or economically or nationally, I can still have joy because I know that no matter what comes, I can do all things through Christ. What is the joy of the faith? It is a joy that's based on the Scriptures. And when I get into the Scriptures and I li live by those, then I have purpose in life. And then I'm not living for self, but I am living for others. I'm looking for good and adversity. I focus not on sacrifice, but on gain. I don't worry. I think about good things. I learn to be content, and I recognize that with Christ, I can get through anything. Now, the question is, how can I get the joy of faith? Somebody said, well, I want that. I want that kind of joy that the Apostle Paul experienced. I want to have that kind of happiness that comes from the faith. How do I do that? Well, let me say one thing is spend time in the study of God's Word to develop your faith. There's only one way to develop faith, and that's to get in the Scriptures. So Sometimes people ask a question like this. You know, I, I, I want to increase my my Bible knowledge, can, how can I do that? And I tell you what, sometimes what people are wanting is they're wanting some little secret or some cliff note that you can give them. I, um, there's a story that's told of a well-known gospel preacher that wrote a number of commentaries on the Old Testament and uh, Book of Revelation that somebody came to him and asked him, said, I want to have the knowledge you have. I can't remember if it was the prophets or the Book of Revelation. I want to have the knowledge you have of that Tell me, how can I do that? You know what his answer was? Invest 40 years of your life. His point was, there's no shortcut. Get into the Word of God and study it. D develop a hunger and a thirst for the Word of God. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that they may grow thereby. When I first started preaching, I used to think 1 Peter 2, 2 was probably a verse about new, new converts as newborn babes. The longer I preach, the more I've studied, the more I'm confident. He's not talking about 
the responsibility of newborn Christians, but he's talking about the responsibility of every Christian to have that longing for the Word of God, just like a baby longs to be filled with his, his mother's milk. We need to have that kind of intense hunger for it. How can, he said, I don't have that kind of joy. How can I have it? Spend time in the study of the Scriptures. Come to know them well. Spend time in prayer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I want you to go over that verse with me. 1 Thessalonians 5. Very end of that first epistle to the brethren at Thessalonica. The apostle Paul writing to them says, Rejoice always. This is one sentence. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. In other words, how do I, how, how do I rejoice always? You know, he connects that with, with prayer and then thanksgiving. And I think there are two ways I access this joy of the faith in that verse. Number one, I, I pray to God. I take everything to Him, and I cast my cares upon it. Can you ever remember as a young child ever worrying about something? You go talk to your mom or dad, and they just say, I'll take care of it. And you just realize, well, you know what? I've taken it, and now I'm just going to trust they're going to take care of that problem. We as children of God have that kind of, I spend time in prayer. But I tell you, the second part of that is I give thanks. How often do you take the opportunity to count your many blessings and name them one by one? One of the great dangers, and I speak, I think, even from personal experience that can happen in our prayer lives if we're not careful, is we sort of allow it to become rote. Lord, we thank Thee for all of our many blessings. And, you know, and, and, and we just sort of say the words, but we don't take the time to actually think about how blessed I really am. I tell you what, when I'm giving thanks, and I truly count my blessings, and I name them one by one, it's hard not to say amen and then rejoice in how blessed we are. How do I get the joy of the faith? Spend some time in prayer. Spend some time counting our blessings. Keep the faith. It's not enough to know it. You've got to keep it. You've got to live by it. Paul said, I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I have kept the faith and learned to trust God. You know how Paul could rejoice? Because he trusted the Lord. I don't have this, I don't have this passage on the chart, but you know, the book of Habakkuk is an interesting book to me because Habakkuk com takes a complaint to God and said, God, why aren't you doing anything? And God says, I am going to do something, and if I told you what I was going to do, you wouldn't believe it anyway. And God said, I'm going to bring the Chaldeans in, and they're going to punish the people of Israel. And Habakkuk says, you can't do that. They're worse than we are. It's in chapter 2 that this statement, is, uh, I think it's chapter 2, this statement is made. It's the theme of the book of Habakkuk, that the just shall live by faith. You know what God is telling Habakkuk? Just trust me. Go to the very end of the book of Habakkuk, and I tell you what Habakkuk says, is I'm going to learn to rejoice. It, it may be that the blossom falls off. It may be that the trees don't produce. It may be that everything looks absolutely hopeless. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to rejoice because I trust you. You know what Habakkuk had learned? He learned he can trust in the Lord. God always tells God's faithful. And I tell you, when I trust in God that I'm not going to be tempted beyond what I'm able, that heaven is worth it, that he's going to provide all of my needs, then I don't have to worry, and therefore the joy is a result of that. It comes, how do I develop trust in God? I tell you how you develop trust in God. It goes back to point number one, get into the Scriptures. Study through that from Old and New Testament and tell me that God's not a God that can be relied on. See, sometimes people have this idea about Christians, that they're the most unhappy people in the world. Walking around deprived of the joy of life. I tell you, that it ought to be the opposite of that. Christians have a joy that the world cannot have a joy they do not possess. It is a joy of the faith. Do you have that kind of joy? I hope that you do. But if not, why not make the opportunity to make things right or to obey the gospel even this very morning? If you're not a Christian, you can become one by hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being buried in the waters of baptism. And when you rise from those waters, I would tell you, you're going to rejoice just like the Ethiopian eunuch did because you have a new relationship with God, a new relationship with others. You have a joy that comes from the faith. Or maybe there's somebody here that has wandered away from the Lord and needs to come back. That's your condition. You can make things right. Would you not do that even right now? Together we stand and we sing.